Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to be rude, but we have to move on, and we have an anti-Semitism panel now. I'd like to call on the participants, Ray Kelly, the former New York City Police Commissioner, Bruce Buck, the Chelsea football uh, chairman that we interviewed earlier, Brooke Goldstein, the founder and executive director of the Lawful Lawfare Project, and Doron Horowitz, senior national security advisor of the Secure Community Network. Finally, Karen B. Glick, a former senior contributing editor of the Jerusalem Post. Please join me on stage. Welcome and thank you uh, for your patience and for waiting for this panel. Um, former New York City Police Commissioner Ray Kelly is also the CEO of The Guardian Group, and he has been studying global anti-Semitism and how to protect Jewish communities abroad and here in the United States. You've been working and studying this issue of global anti-Semitism. Tell us about your work and your findings and recommendations. Well, I'm here because of uh, Rama Lauder. Uh, Mr. Lauder, of course, uh, an iconic uh, fighter against anti-Semitism for so many decades. He spoke here uh, this morning. Uh, he asked me to do an assessment, uh, particularly in Europe, of the rising tide of anti-Semitism. I think he asked me because I have a lot of experience in uh, security. I was a longer serving police commissioner here for 14 years in the police department over 40 years, in the Treasury Department, uh, Interpol, lot, well, lots of security. So uh, I think he also liked some of the things that we put in place here to protect the, uh, the Jewish community and to outreach uh, as well. Uh, I put together a team. My team consisted of David Cohn, 35-year veteran of the Central Intelligence Agency, worked for me in the police department, Mitchell Silver, head of intelligence analysis, in, in the police department, and we did a lot of research and set out to go to countries in, uh, in Europe. And we uh, visited uh, Austria, uh, Belgium, Denmark, England, France, Germany, Hungary, Poland, uh, Ukraine, and Sweden. Talked to lots of people, uh, political people, former politicians, Jewish leaders, the Jewish man and woman on the street, uh, Muslim leaders, uh, that, that sort of thing. We even wore kippahs on the street in Paris to get a reaction, and we got a reaction. <laughs> um, so, positive or negative reactions? Uh, I would call it a negative reaction, so hoops, uh, whoops, uh, as, we walked, uh, as we walked by. Uh, so what do we find? No surprises. Anti-Semitism is ingrained in Europe. Many people told us that they thought it was as high as it was since uh, World War uh, II. Uh, it's really fed by the internet, fed by uh, satellite TV coming from the, the Middle East. Uh, the right-wing neo-Nazis are using the populist movement in Europe as, uh, as cover. Uh, they feel emboldened to sort of come out of their shadows. Uh, on the left, the, the BDS movement is certainly alive and well, and they don't make pretenses too much anymore about being anti-Zionist. It really is hardcore anti-Semitism. We also found that the, the, the biggest physical threat to the Jewish community is, quite frankly, from the Muslim uh, community. And we looked at all of those countries. We have findings for all of them and recommendations but I think the, the, where the problem is most acute is France. And uh, so I, I just want to talk a little bit about France. Hate speech is, hate speech is outlawed in France, yet it, Jewish world in France is bombarded uh, all the time by a, a litany of vituperative speech on the internet, as they say, in newspapers, uh, in, in satellite the TV. We're told that there's a 74% increase of attacks against, against Jews. Most people we talked to thought that, that it was uh, much higher. 
Many of the attacks could be categorized as harassment, but there are certainly serious assaults, and of course, we had murder. Mrs. Halimi in, in 2017, Mrs. Knoll in, in 2018. We see now the Yellow Vest uh, movement starting as a tax protest against the, the Senator, I mean, uh, President uh, Macron. It has a significant anti-Semitic bent uh, to it now. A survey showed that as many as 50% of the demonstrators believe there's this huge Zionist plot to, to take over the world. And 70% of Jewish age uh, school children in France are going to religious schools, which is the highest percentage of any uh, country in France. And that's because, in our judgment, the, the environment, the harassment environment that young Jewish children are subjected to. I'll stop there. But. All right, yeah, we, we, we'll go up on the follow-up follow question. We'll talk about countering anti-Semitism. But Doran Hor Horowitz, uh, you joined the Secure Community Network in 2016 as the Senior National Security Advisor, and you are spearheading the National Campus Security Initiative, a strategic effort and program to address the safety and security needs of Jewish students and organizations on campus. As such, You've seen many attacks, I know, uh, over the last years. Uh, just like Judah Samet, you were in Pittsburgh right after the attack. What did you see? Tell us about how you can empower the community. What can be done about this? First of all, thank you. It's an honor to be here on the panel with everyone. And also, a uh, happy Abba Day to everyone, to all the fathers out there. Um, I think that my organization represents the not why or where the anti-Semitism is coming, but rather what is our responsibility in terms of owning our own safety and security, which has to result in empowerment and education and training. In less than two minutes, 11 Jews were not killed, were not murdered, but rather massacred. I, in a very small, group of people were at the crime scene when not a body was moved. And you saw the direct result of hate. And what that means is, rather than trying to understand why, the next question of the discussion has to shift to, what is our responsibility? In those first few minutes, when law enforcement arrives on the scene, as courageous as they did, and in Pittsburgh it was incredibly uh, quick, we have responsibility to begin to own our safety and security through prevention, empowering people with the tools and the infrastructure to be able to respond and manage, and more importantly, to recover, to determine resiliency. One of the things that I'm observing most significantly in this country, and especially in the last eight months, is that the Jewish community is perceived to be a soft target. So our mission in the Secure Community Network is to contribute to changing that perception. So if an individual is intent for whatever ideological or extreme ideology that motivates that individual to pick up a weapon and enter a Jewish institution, they have to be deterred. And that responsibility is up to us in terms of owning that. Thank you. Um, Brooke Goldstein is a human rights lawyer. She's the founder and executive director of the Lawfare Project, a nonprofit think tank and litigation fund that works to protect the human and civil rights of Jews and pro-Israel communities worldwide. The project funds legal action to protect free speech and civil rights by challenging anti-Semitism and discrimination against Jews and others. So, Brooke, tell us about your work and how you see the situation from your perspective. Thank you. I just want to also thank the Jerusalem Post for having me. It is an honor to be here today. Um, so, I run the world's only Jewish civil rights litigation fund. And in the last three years, we have amassed an army of lawyers, over 350 lawyers from around the world. We work with over 34 major international law firms. 
We have filed over 77 legal actions in 16 different jurisdictions, and we have done so for under $1 million. And what motivates us is to aggressively pursue the civil rights of the Jewish community in all Western democracies. And in fact, when I started doing what I'm doing now, I was called by some community members as too aggressive. And I thought, well, what a compliment to aggressively assert the civil and human rights of the Jewish community. What has been holding us back so far? And if you look at how, you know, the beauty of living in a liberal democracy is the ability of civilians to take advantage of the judicial system and set civil rights precedents. If you look at the fabric of our society right now and the rights that we enjoy, they are products of seminal cases. Roe v. Wade, women's reproductive rights, Brown v. Board of Education, desegregation in schools. And before I founded the project, I thought, well, where are the seminal Jewish civil rights cases? How is it that nobody has filed and litigated in a US court of law that Jewish students are entitled to equal protection under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act? We have never brought and litigated that case. So in the past four years, uh, we have had quite some success, thank God. We engaged in a uh, monumental settlement with San Francisco State University, which some may know as the ground zero for the campus radicalization movement. For the first time in American history, we had a state entity, the California State University system, recognize that Zionism is an integral part of the religious cultural and ethnic identity of Jewish students, therefore expressions of which are protected under the law. We have a lawsuit right now uh, against the French government for their discriminatory and politicized labeling practices against Israeli products. We are suing also the Belgian government for their banning of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, excuse me, shechita, which is religious slaughter. And we have the first ever case in New York State Court against a BDS organization, the National Lawyers Guild, which, um, which uh, uh, not only passed a BDS resolution, which is free speech, but actually implemented it in the sense that they refuse to do business with my client because they are Israeli. BDS, and we should stop using the acronym, is what it is is commercial, illegal commercial discrimination against somebody because of their national origin. Just like I can't have a restaurant and say, no Chinese allowed. I can't have a business and say, no Israelis allowed. It is illegal, and NLG will be held account. Thank you. Uh, uh, Carolyn, Carolyn Glick needs no introduction to this audience. Carolyn, um, despite what we've heard, we've still seen the two worst attacks in Pittsburgh and Poway in American history in the last year. Um, uh, how do you, as an Israeli, see the situation, um, and what do you see as an answer to this rising tide of anti-Semitism and BDS? Look, I think that it's very important to remember one thing, which is that the Jews aren't um, we can't decide who, get, who is an anti-Semite or not. We can't allow them to define us. I mean, their hatred defines them. It has nothing to do with who we are as Jews, and it's very important for us to point that out. And so then the question becomes, how does a Jewish uh, community in the United States and in other countries, in France and Belgium and others, and Australia, protect itself from people that are quite simply beyond our control. They're not anti-Semites because of something that the Jews did. They're anti-Semites because they're bigots. And they've chosen to attach their bigotry to Jewish people. And it's very important to make that distinction. And I think that one of the things that we see lacking in the American Jewish response is that the establishment of the Jewish community in the United States is not acting as Brooke Goldstein is acting, is not acting you know, in, a, in a, an assertive way to ensure no more Jewish victims. To the contrary, they're sort of uh, regaling in their victimization and saying, look, we're victims too, when exactly the opposite should be the approach. No, we're not ever gonna be victims in the United States of America. We don't accept Jewish victims. That's not in our lingo. There can't be Jewish victims. And one of the ways, 
And one of the ways, I mean, there's nothing sexy about dying, you know, and, and one, of, one, of the, one of the aspects to that is that we see, uh, unfortunately, I think one of the serious problems that we're seeing in the American Jewish community is that people are leading Jewish organizations who are facilitating anti-Semitism by refusing to call uh, call it by its name. When you see people trimming on the issue of BDS and saying, well, this is okay and that's not okay, what they're actually doing is empowering people to crawl into the crevices and mainstream Jewish hate, anti, you know, hatred for Jews. And um, this is already happening. We saw in Germany just this week, you know, a major story, which is that the head of the Jewish Museum, after I think seven years of promoting BDS under the aegis of the Jewish Museum in, in Berlin was finally forced out of his position, which is a great victory, but it's also partially a defeat because seven years after he had his first pro-BDS uh, uh, meeting there, something that, the, that Benny Weinthal of the Jerusalem Post covered exclusively, he was still there. And we see this in Jewish organizations in this country as well, and I'm not talking about JVP, I'm talking about actual mainstream Jewish organizations that refuse to truly fight BDS and truly go against this sort of uh, rising tide of anti-Semitism in this country. And I think that that's one of the major and most acute challenges that the, that the uh, community here faces. Um, Ray Kelly, um, I think the, the big question in my mind, and I'm sure in many people's minds, is how do you stop these crazy radicals um, from carrying out these attacks? How do you uh, thwart it? How do you prevent it? How do you uh, f find out beforehand that they're planning these things? You know, religious institutions, uh, certain synagogues, want to be sort of open venues. They want people to feel free to, to come in. Uh, if you look at many synagogues in Europe, they are much better protected than we are here. They have sort of the two-door approach, where if you're going to go into a synagogue, you're going to be screened. Someone's going to look at you, you'll go into the first door of the room, they're going to look at you again, uh, are they familiar with you, whatever, and then you can go into the, into the, main, uh, the main synagogue. That did not happen, of course, in Pittsburgh. It did not happen in, in Poway. So I think it's something that we have to look seriously at, screening. Screening is the word. Vigilance is, is the word uh, now. I mean, it just, just the reality of where we are at this point in, in history. And uh, synagogues are not always configured to do this. I understand that. But some money has to be spent. Uh, the federal government is, is providing money. I know uh, UJA and the Federation also moving in this, in this direction. But volunteers, you have to get volunteers if you can't afford to have a, a security person. Ideally, you'd have a security person on the door, professional security person, perhaps armed. But if you can't do that, you gotta get volunteers to, to help. Security, I mean, the vigilance and scanning is now the watchword. Doran Horowitz, uh, how, how do you see this? Do you think Israel can play a role uh, in combating anti-Semitism around the world? So, so certainly there are best practices in Israel that are common denominators and, and strong principles in terms of best practices. But um, as Mr. Kelly said, we, we are the answer. My organization is the answer in terms of operational security. I think that there, the first step is there needs to be a recognition and acknowledgement of a reality that people are fully intent in targeting Jewish houses of worship and Jewish institutions. Once that reality is accepted, then you can move on to the next step in terms of what is it that I need to identify to ensure that I have the ability as a synagogue to monitor every individual from coming in. And there are basic principles. One is prevention, which is training, education, guidelines, define clear policies, and the development of emergency procedures. A perfect example right now is, God forbid, right now we heard gunshots. Who here in the room would know what to do, where to go? Our message is that it's time that we begin to own and empower ourselves with that knowledge. So prevention is training and education, policies, 
designing uh, an infrastructure, management and response. What tools do you have available in real time to deny entry of a threat and perhaps respond to it in the best capable capabilities that you've developed beforehand? And then, of course, response and recovery. A couple of years ago, there was over 160 bomb threats around this country, if you all recall. There was not one bomb that was detonated. With minimal effort, the national Jewish community in this country and in other places was impacted significantly, which at one point highlights the ability to respond, but it also highlighted vulnerabilities that need to be addressed. And yes, there are government grants, thank God, that helps contribute to enhancing the capability and the capacity of a Jewish institution. But no longer can we say, I didn't do anything because there's no money. Security, Jewish communal security, is an act of will, first and foremost. And it's something that we need to step up to the plate. Invest in prevention so that your ability to respond and manage is easier so that your doors are open the next day. No longer, as soon as I walked out of the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, and I took my hazmat suit off, a mother ran right to us. In the year 2018, asked me, do I send my kids to school tomorrow? That should not be a question asked by the Jewish community. And that requires our responsibility in empowering ourselves with education, knowledge, and resiliency. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Brooke Goldstein, I want to pick up on what you said about BDS. What do you think is the most effective way to counter BDS, uh, especially on college campuses in America? Um, look, I think that there needs to be a complete paradigm shift in the Jewish community and our way of thought and the way that we communicate. First of all, I wish this panel was called you know, empowering the Jewish community to enforce their civil rights, not can anti-Semitism be stopped. And it's anything as small as using the terminology, using the acronym BDS, why don't we just call it illegal commercial discrimination, racism, using terminology like two-state solution, creating another Islamist state in a sea of failed Islamic dictatorships is not a solution to anything. Using terminology like settlement, what's a Jewish settlement? This isn't 1920 Russia. There are Jewish homes, there are Jewish villages, and anybody who says that a Jewish home is an obstacle to peace is advocating for a Jude and Rhine Islamist Palestinian state. So we have to change our terminology. Number two, number two, we have to encourage, and I know that the story of Purim was mentioned earlier as well by Judah, we have to encourage Zionist pride. Zionism is the oldest, the original national liberation movement of the world's oldest ethnic minority, the Jewish people. It is the original civil rights movement. It's a civil rights movement that inspired almost all other civil rights movements. We invented intersectionality. We were marching hand in hand with African Americans as they were marching in the 1950s for their rights. And Zionism is a progressive value. So any shunning of that term, and we have to empower the Jewish community. And finally, also, how do we defeat it? The one thing that I've learned in my career is that no matter how anti-Semitic you are, you will always act in your own best interest, in your own self-interest. So we have to make it in the self-interest of those people who we are targeting, so to speak, to discontinue their targeting of Jews. Case in point, Rutgers University, when they hosted the flotilla movement and they did a fundraiser for US to Gaza, Baca, Code Pink, all groups that are connected to the foreign designated terrorist group Hamas, the Jewish community were writing letters, we were doing press releases, we were writing articles about how very angry we were that Rutgers University was hosting this anti-Semitic movement. And of course, the president said, free speech, free speech. I'm not gonna get into the fallacy of that argument, but that's what he was resting his laurels on. Well, we wrote him a nice 35-page letter telling him no matter how much he 
loves the flotilla movement, if he releases one penny of those funds, he now is on notice that they will go to a designated terrorist group, and he personally risks spending up to 22 years in jail. Well, lo and behold, none of the money was released, and they were never invited back on campus again. Carolyn, you're, you... your remedy to this issue. Look, I, I think that one of the things that you have to do also is diagnose it. And I, and I take what Brooke said, but I think that one of the aspects of BDS that you really have to pay attention to is that more than trying to single Israel out for economic warfare and political warfare, the, really, uh, the primary victims of this movement or this campaign on college campuses in particular are Jewish Americans. And they're targeted specifically as Jewish Americans. And if you, and, and what the, what the uh, activists who are behind the BDS movement are trying to do is separate the American Jews from Israeli Jews by pretending that this is a movement about Israel when, when it really is about in this country, not in perhaps in Europe less so, but in this country it's about uh, marginalizing Jews as a political actor both on campuses and generally throughout the United States. It's making it, um, American Jews pay a social uh, and academic price for voicing uh, their support for an affinity towards the Jewish state and the Jewish people in general. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a campaign to deny basic civil rights to American Jews. And it's important for the American Jewish community to focus on that because I think an enormous number of resources of the community to fight BDS are fighting the wrong target. It's in defense of Israel when that's not the victim and that's not the target. They are the target. They are being targeted far more than Israel. And if they don't recognize that this is an assault against them, then they're not going to fight it properly. And all of the good Hasbara efforts that they put out about settlements, yes or no, about uh, uh, em uh, em enabling the formation of another terrorist state west of the Jordan, yes or no, that's, that's a secondary issue. The primary issue is that Jewish students in the United States and Jews throughout the United States must be protected in their right to be whoever they want. And if there's, and their Zionism, as Brooke said, is an inherent part of their Judaism, and by trying in any way, shape, or form to silence them or criminalize them or delegitimize them is an assault against Jews in the United States as American Jews, and it has to be fought in that way. And if it isn't fought in this way, and for over a decade we've seen that people are, are accepting at face value the claim of the BDS movement that this is about Israel, then they keep missing the point. The point is that the rights of American Jews on college campuses and beyond, don't forget the Leo, Leon Klinghoffer opera that they put on at the Met here in New York a few years ago, the, the rights, the basic civil rights of American Jews is being increasingly constrained by this anti-Semitic campaign and American Jews aren't fighting the, 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 aren't fighting this, this attack against them personally because they don't recognize it as such. So I think that the primary thing that has to happen here is that this misidentification that's deliberate on the part of the BDS movement is pushed back against by the organized and unorganized American Jewish community. Yeah. They're not going to accept this. Thank you. Um, uh, Brooke, you want to do I want to just say how very on point what Carolyn just said is, in fact, um, San Francisco State University, uh, the lawsuit was predicated on a couple facts. Number one, the uh, almost violent shutdown of the former mayor of Jerusalem near Barkat speech. And the second was there was a Know Your Rights Fair. And they invited all student groups to participate where they can advertise who they are. And they specifically told Hillel the only Jewish student group on campus, they could not participate because they were Zionist. And the argument that we made in our lawsuit is that is de facto discrimination because only Jews, again, American Jews. It's actually de jure discrimination. Okay, okay. okay. got All right. it. Let's I learn from Carolyn every day, but only Jews are given that political litmus test. They didn't ask the Chinese student group, wait a minute, before you table at this fair, 
are you pro-China's one-child policy or anti-China's one policy? They didn't ask the Iranian students, are you for Iranian nuclear disarmament? But they said, hey, you Jew, are you for occupation? Are you anti-BDS? And only if you answer the way I want you to can you therefore participate in our government-funded event. Uh, Ray Kelly, fi final concluding remark from you uh, as former police commissioner of New York. Uh, talk in the microphone. I would say that uh, synagogues, rabbis, people in charge of Jewish institutions should get closer to the police. Police have a lot of resources. They can develop plans. I think every place needs a fairly sophisticated security plan. As Doran said, we have to practice these things. We have exercise them. The police can be very helpful in that regard. So on behalf of all of you, I'd like to thank uh, Brooke Goldstein, Doran Horowitz, Ray Kelly, and Carolyn Glake. Thank you so much.